Germany's early advance through the Soviet Union had been fierce and unstoppable, thanks in part to the air superiority that the Wehrmacht had attained over the region. As both factions ardently fought during five excruciating months in the Battle of Stalingrad, the Soviets would finally turn the table with Operation Uranus by encircling the invaders and pushing them back. Despite the overwhelming victory, the Soviet High Command learned a brutal lesson in Stalingrad. The Luftwaffe significantly outclassed their own air force. If they wanted to hold their advantage and push the Nazis out of Russia, they would have to develop better warplanes immediately. So began the development of the Yak-3, the smallest fighter used in World War II and an aircraft that would give the Luftwaffe a run for its money. As the tiny, nimble fighter entered the battlefield of the Eastern Front in the summer of 1944, the German commanders were stunned by what the modest plane could do, and they were forced to issue an urgent order in a frantic attempt to stop the new Soviet threat. Lesson from Stalingrad Despite the failure to capture Moscow, Operation Barbarossa had been a disaster for the Red Army, as it was unable to hold back the mighty German Blitzkrieg when it violently tore through Soviet territories. In the end, the Soviets could only slow the invasion and then retreat further back into the Russian wastelands as the Wehrmacht drew ever closer to its objectives. Much of Germany's success was due to the swift disabling of the Soviet Union's aerial infrastructure before the land invasion, which gave them complete air superiority over the region as they pierced deeper into Russia. Being caught by surprise by the invasion and the destruction of their air bases, the Soviets had little opportunity to study how their air force compared to the Luftwaffe. However, the opportunity would come once Hitler changed his strategy and sent his troops to the southern Soviet regions to capture the oil fields in the Caucasus. As the Wehrmacht made a dash for Stalingrad, the might of the Luftwaffe became more than apparent. The southern city was effectively bombed to rubble before a German soldier could set foot on its soil. And when Stalin unleashed Operation Uranus to encircle the German forces in the city, the Soviets watched as the German Air Force, protected by its swift Fokowolf FW-190s, delivered supplies while outmaneuvering their pilots. Still, Stalingrad would be a rotund victory for the Red Army, but the flaws of its already depleted air force were made more transparent than ever. The Yak-1s, the most popular fighter aircraft used by the Soviets, paled in comparison to the Fokowolf FW-190 when it came to speed, range, rate of climb, and agility. If the Soviets wanted to hold their advantage and send the Germans back to Berlin, they would need to gain air superiority. And for that, they needed a new workhorse fighter, one that could face off against the masterful German engineering. Think small. Alexander Sergeyevich Yakovlev, the aeronautical engineer responsible for the Yak-1, was determined to design the replacement for his own ubiquitous fighter. By this time, Yakovlev had already designed several successful aircraft for the Soviet military, and he had built the JSC AS Yakovlev Design Bureau, a government agency tasked with outlining and producing military aircraft for the Red Army. Thus, in 1943, Yukovlev and a team of engineers designed a modern and powerful fighter aircraft that took advantage of the Yak-1's attributes, but took its survivability, flight characteristics, and firepower to a whole new level. Yukovlev's philosophy was straightforward. Take the outline of a Yak-1, put in a more powerful engine, and make the airframe smaller and lighter, so the result would be a faster and more maneuverable aircraft, while also being able to carry heavier armament. The engineer had previously used Klimov engines, and had grown fond of their reliability, ease of maintenance, and raw power, so he decided to use the same Klimov M105 V12 liquid-cooled piston engine he had fitted into his previous design, the Yak-9. This aircraft had proven to be a force to be reckoned with, and it was loved by Soviet pilots. However, it was stifled, and its large and heavy frame did not allow the engine's capabilities to shine at their full potential. Yakovlev then finished the Yak-1M, a prototype that would ultimately lead to the Yak-3's final design. Yak-3 The Yakovlev Yak-3 was fitted with a VK-105 PF-2, the latest iteration of the M105 engine family, where P showed support for a Modernaya Pushka. This autocannon was synchronized to fire between the engine banks through the propeller shaft mounting. The warplane incorporated a wing of a similar design to its predecessor, but with a smaller surface area and additional aerodynamic refinements. 
One upgrade was the new placement of the oil radiator, which was moved from the chin to the wing roots, creating a sharp difference between the new outline and previous Yak designs. Throughout its career, the Yak-3 would wield a vast array of weapon systems, according to the specific role it would take as part of an operation. Still, the initial 197 units were lightly armed, with a single Modernaya Pushka mount 20mm SHVAK cannon and one 12.7mm UBS synchronized machine gun. This machine gun was synchronized to the engine to fire through the propeller without damaging the blades. Many fighter designers at the time avoided using synchronized machine guns due to the potential hazard and higher upkeep costs. Still, Yakovlev wanted to keep the wings free of load and give the pilots the advantage of controlling their guns as they steered the plane. Preliminary tests were highly promising, but Yakovlev wanted to accentuate the power and speed the new Yak-3 could offer. So the VK-105 PF-2 engine was modified from a manifold pressure of 1,050 to 1,100 millimeters of mercury. The boost increased the time needed to reach an altitude of 16,000 feet by 0.1 seconds, the takeoff runs by 49 feet, the height gains in a combat loop by 160 feet, and the speed below altitudes of 7,900 feet by 4 miles per hour. The aircraft's final version was like nothing Soviet pilots had flown before. Lead test pilot Peter Mikhailovich Stefanovsky was so awestruck with the new aircraft's performance that he officially recommended that it should immediately replace the Yak-1 and Yak-7 and only spare the Yak-9 because of its suitable performance. After an intense but fruitful development phase, the newly designated Yak-3 entered service in 1944. It would soon exceed all expectations and would quickly become the backbone of the Soviet fighter force. Combat Service Light, small, nimble, and formidably fast, the Yak-3 was a forgiving, easy-to-handle aircraft that both novice and experienced pilots adored. It was robust, easy to maintain, and when used correctly, a highly reliable dogfighter. However, the Yak-3's performance quickly degraded when flying above 13,000 feet. But pilots quickly learned to use it as a tactical fighter, flying low over battlefields and intercepting the enemy close to the ground, where the aircraft showed terrific performance. When the new Yak made it to the battlefront in the summer of 1944, it didn't take long to start shifting the balance in the Soviet Union's favor, much to Germany's dismay. The Yak-3's service tests were conducted by the 91st Fighter Aviation Regiment of the 2nd Air Army, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Kovalyov in June and July of 1944. The squadron had the task of gaining air superiority over a large contested area in Eastern Europe. The results were overwhelming. During 431 sorties, the novel plane shot down 20 Luftwaffe fighters and three Ju-87 bombers, while Soviet forces only lost three aircraft. Then, on June 16, 1944, 18 Yak-3s clashed against 24 German aircraft in a fierce battle over air superiority in the region. The tiny Soviet fighters shot down 15 German aircraft against a loss of a single Yak-3 warplane. The results were not good for the Luftwaffe, which was forced to cease activities in that sector after being utterly outmatched. To further cement its position as the new king of the skies, on July 17th, eight Yaks intercepted a formation of 60 German aircraft, including escorting fighters. The dogfight was intense and dramatic. The Luftwaffe lost three Ju-87s and four Bf-109Gs, with zero losses from the Soviet side. In response to the tiny fighters' overwhelming superiority, the Luftwaffe issued an urgent order to all pilots, quote, Avoid combat below 5,000 meters, with Yakovlev fighters lacking an oil cooler intake beneath the nose. The Act 3s superiority was so significant that German pilots had to resort to surprise tactics and attack the fighters from high altitudes to get the upper hand before the small Soviet warplane could unleash its full potential. From its deployment to the fall of Berlin, the Act 3 would be a brutal reminder of the Red Army's unexpected reawakening after the debacle at Stalingrad. Almost 5,000 units were built, and the Luftwaffe would never again achieve air superiority. The role that the smallest fighter in World War II played in that outcome would be one for the history books. Thank you for watching our video. What do you think made the Yak-3 so overwhelmingly successful against the German aircraft? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, and make sure to subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels for more exciting history-inspired content. Also hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. Stay tuned.